conundrum castle, Walter Scott, the Antiquary. For um, <clears throat> those of you that don't know, I should explain the title. Um, conundrum castle was one of the many pet names that Sir Walter Scott gave to his marvellous creation that uh, was his border home near Gallows Shields. Now, some folk would say, no, it was near Melrose, but they would be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> near a galley. <laughs> Uh, another course that he called it was a flippity gibbet of a house to suit an antiquary. And I hope that some of these terms will encompass what I've got to say tonight. However, at this precise moment, I'm standing here like many other lecturers in the same position, wondering how on earth did I get myself into this? And why should I be trying to tell such an august and knowledgeable not audience even a little bit about Sir Walter Scott? And as I look around tonight, I recognise many people who know an awful lot more about Scott the Antiquary and Abbotsford than I do. Um, one just needs to think about luminaries such as uh, Ian Gordon Brown, Professor Purdy, uh, Ian Gow, Trevor Cowie, Colin Wallace, Hugh Cheap. They all know a heck of a lot more about Scott the Antiquary than I do. But I would like to think that I do have a great deal of enthusiasm for Scott and hopefully some empathy for him as well. So thinking again about why me, and I'm certainly thinking that right now, a um, couple of reasons. First of all, as Claire said, it's been my privilege to have been appointed keeper of the new Department of Scottish History and Archaeology. Now, that department essentially encompasses most of the Scottish collections which saw their origins in the activities of our own society, the Society of Antiquities. Right from its very inception in um, 1780, the Society collected holistically uh, to further the study of Scotland's past. Now, I would like to try and argue that Sir Walter, uh, too, took a very inclusive view of what constituted the material culture of Scotland's past. The fact that the Society's formative years coincided with Scott's rise to fame meant that inevitably there were links between them although these were perhaps not as strong as we might think, uh, and I'll look at that a wee bit later as well. Second reason for being here, a wee bit more frivolous, I suppose. Uh, well, it's not frivolous at all. Actually, I was very privileged, again, as Claire said, to have been elected vice president of the Society of Antiquities for my three-year term a few years ago. Guess who also was vice president of the Society? This chap, Sir Walter Scott, although he called himself president but our records make it fairly clear he was vice president. <laughs> so, all I have to do to be upside Scott is discover a towering genius and become the best, one of the best ever selling uh, authors in the world. No problems. Uh, I've got about four years to do it because I am four years younger than Scott was when he died at his beloved old Abbotsford on the 21st of September 1832. Unfortunately, he was no longer attended by, I'm afraid to say, his butler, one William Dalgleish. <laughs> My putative ancestor had uh, retired the year before, so he had nothing to do with Scott's death, I can assure you. But more seriously, I have another reason for being here tonight, and that is because in 2009, I was very flattered to be asked to become a trustee of Abbotsford. Uh, and this is an excellent opportunity, quite frankly, to give it a plug. Um, and to tell you a little bit about what the team down at Abbotsford have been doing in the past four years. Uh, and of course, I'll be taking names and expecting every one of you to sign in blood to say that you're going to be going down there to visit to keep it going, because it really is very important that we do keep it going. So, just in case you can't, don't know what it looks like, this is Abbotsford from the River Tweed side, uh, which is a good side because it's kind of facing gala. <laughs> and this is Walter Scott, in case you don't know who he is. So let's actually start uh, and say a little bit about Scott and his creation of Abbotsford. He was, of course, born in Edinburgh in 1771 of good border stock. My birth was neither distinguished nor sordid, he said. He was destined for a legal career in the footsteps of his lawyer father, and was educated at both the Royal High School and then went on to Edinburgh University with a little time out at Kelso Grammar School where he met his future printers and partners, the Ballantines. Um, that's another thing. I actually went to Kelso for school for a wee while, but I don't talk about that very much. <clears throat> he became an advocate in 1792, uh, and, but obviously there's no doubt that his real love was literature. 
He was a prodigious reader, uh, and of course he had a real talent for languages. Indeed, his very first literary um, excursions were translations of contemporary German poetry. His legal work uh, led him uh, to the court circuit and the barbers, and allowed him, allowed him to indulge in his famous border rage to collect ballads and stories with William Short, uh, Robert Shortreed and William Laidlaw. He published the results, of course, as we all know, in The Minstrelsy of the Scottish Border in 1802. He became Sheriff Deputy of Selkirk, and let's face it, Selkirk certainly needs lots of sheriffs. <laughs> the Shira, as he was called, he became Sheriff Deputy in 1799. Now, his position technically required him to have a residence in the borders, although it took him until uh, 1803 before he realised this, where he took a lease on ashy steel from one of his relatives. But he did indeed hanker to be a real border laird. And this was made possible by his enormous success that he had in publishing his own poetry. The Lay of the Last Minstrel in 1805, Marmion in 1808, Lady of the Lake in 1810. And of course, at this time, poetry was considered to be the, the highest form of literary endeavour. Um, with Scott, of course, to thank for the, the popularisation of the historical novel, but his mega success in selling historical novels came later. His poetry came first. Well, with his legal career secure and his literary one paying him reasonably handsomely, he resolved to buy a property on Tweedside and he eventually settled on what would become Abbotsford in 1811 and purchased it after some very strenuous negotiations with the Reverend Dr. Robert Douglas, the very canny and far-sighted minister of Galashiels. <laughs> There's a theme that you may pick up coming through here. <laughs> Um, Douglas wouldn't budge on price, and I know a lot of Gala folk that are still like that. <laughs> um, 4,000 guineas for a 110-acre property called Newart Hawk, now better known as uh, Cartley Hall, or more whimsically, because it was unimproved and undrained and a wee bit down at heel, as Clarty Hall. Um, <laughs> Scott was attracted to the site. Um, because it was on the River Tweed. It was a beautiful site. It still is a beautiful site. And here it shows his vision. He had a very wide vision. It wasn't well maintained, but you could see the possibilities, um, particularly for spectacular planting. Scott wasn't, doesn't seem to have been that interested in farming, but he was interested in trees and landscape. And miraculously, there's still a good deal of what he planted still visible today. The site also appealed to Scott. Um, because of its antiquarian associations. <clears throat> it had a view of the earthwork known as the Cat Trail. It was the, the site of uh, an incident of the, just after the Battle of Melrose in 1526, when the Cares fought with the Scots and the Elliots. And it also contained the site of a ford on the old Roman road, used, reportedly used by the monks in nearby Melrose Abbey. And immediately on taking possession of the property, Scott renamed it Abbotsford. And here we should say it was called Abbotsford. It is still called Abbotsford. It is not Abbotsford House. <clears throat> the building we know today, and isn't that quite a romantic uh, picture? Um, the building we know today did not immediately spring up. Uh, and indeed, Scott lived there for several years in what was essentially an, ex uh, an extended farmhouse with an attached steading. But he had very grand plans. And he set about assembling a committee of taste to advise him on the totality of the project. The architecture, the decoration, the collections and the landscape were all to be brought together as a seamless whole. These uh, this, the members of this committee of taste included, amongst others, but there were many more, James Skeen of Rubislaw, Daniel Terry, the actor and theatrical impresario, and William uh, Atkinson the, the, as a presiding architect over it all. The product was, of course, an immensely influential building in the development of the Romantic movement, uh, and of course in the popularization of Scott's baronial style. But this is a good picture to illustrate it. Scott's Abbotsford was not a huge building. It's not a great, it's not like the great ducal uh, building uh, along the road of the, the Dukes of Buccleuch. It's quite a small and compact building, uh, and Ian Gow, I think, has very convincingly called it a villa. It is a villa. The larger thing that we see today is the product of later expansion, and we'll talk about that a wee bit later. But the picture we see here is essentially the, the main elements 
that um, were that Scott built. And we'll say a little bit about how he went about that. In 1817 to 18, he built the first major extension, consisting of a conservatory, the dining room, his very first study, the armory, and the bedrooms above, and the kitchens and services below, with a firm of uh, builders called Sanderson and Patterson from Gala Shields. And that's basically this end of it here. The cottage was about there, more or less, and then this is the, the much grander uh, northeast wing, which was built between 1822 and 1825, this time by uh, John and Thomas Smith of Darnick, that metropolis just outside Melrose. This wing completely replaced the cottage um, and created a, a baronial porch, yeah. a wonderful entrance hallway, another study, a new study, drawing room, uh, and the magnificent library that we see here. Uh, Scott worked with Atkinson and others, such as George Bullock, Terry, of course, and David Ramsey Hay to produce this magical place. And I think anybody that's been there will recognize it is truly magical. <clears throat> we still have some of the designs for furniture by Atkinson and Bridgens. Um, and these were produced by Bullock, so these the chairs that we can still see in the corner there. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. But Scott also used local craftsmen, including um, Joseph Schillinglaw, a cabinet maker from Darnick, very talented chap, who made, amongst all sorts of other things, this fantastic library table. Now, you have to try and imagine this without the rather kind of later uh, vitrine that's stuck on top of it, it's, but it is a most amazing piece. And of course, Scott embraced the new, he embraced the modern as well, uh, by famously installing, being amongst the first to install gas lighting, uh, the newfangled gas lighting. And curiously enough, during the restorations, we have found some of the, the original, we think the original gas pipes relating to the, the first installation of gas lighting, and these have been preserved. Um, the gas lighting, of course, was to be very necessary a few years later when he set himself the rather Herculean task of writing himself out of debt, and I quote, under the intense and burning glare of the broad star of gas, which hung in the air immediately over his writing table. There we go. And this is in his, the second study that he would have been writing uh, in to get himself out of debt. But the building itself was intended from the very outset not just to be a repository for his collections, but to be an integral part of, with them, uh, creating a unified whole. And his collections, which are talk about for a wee while now, came to him in a variety of ways. Firstly, he was the recipient of a welter of gifts from both friends and acquaintances. And these were often incorporated into the very fabric and decoration of the building. For example, the sumptuous green Chinese wallpaper here was a gift from his kins kinsman, Captain Hugh Scott of the East India Company. Moving outside, the door and surrounding stonework from the Edinburgh toll booth was also a gift. It was demolished uh, in um, 1817. And of course, Scott rather whimsically incorporated it into the first floor of the building, up here. Shaky hands, that's my sore back. <clears throat> uh, much to the annoyance of Ruskin, apparently. Yeah. And you can't really see it. It's not very easy to see, um, unfortunately. Um, also outside, of course, in the, the grounds this time, um, he was given these carved panels which originally adorned the Edinburgh Market Cross, or Market Cross. Um, the Market Cross was demolished way back in 1756, but the carvings and the shaft were preserved by a variety of people in Edinburgh until eventually uh, the painter Sir Henry Rayburn gifted them to Scott, who incorporated in, into the south wall of the, his garden, this wall here. Try as I might, as a trustee of Abbotsford, could I find a picture of the dashed things the correct way around? Because it's on the other side of this wall. I, I couldn't. Uh, and of course, every one of you later on today will say, I've got one of those pictures. Yeah. But, but the, those roundels at the back, the roundels here are incorporated into the other side of the wall. <clears throat> and when I consider this, that Scott developed this as a building that was meant to integrate the collections with the building, I can't help reflecting back on the process of the designing of the Museum of Scotland, 
which I still refer to it as, um, where there was a similar intention to fully integrate the collections with the building. But I'll leave it up to you to decide whether that worked or not. Controversial. Scott, of course, also collected himself. Uh, this Middle Bronze Age spearhead was labelled in his own handwriting that it had been dug out from an encampment, an encampment near the Eildon Hills. That, of course, is now in the National Museum. But he also, most spectacularly, utilised a vast network of like-minded antiquarians, men such as Charles Kirkpatrick Sharp, and perhaps most spectacularly, this chap, Joseph Train, the Dumfriesshire antiquary who was the source of many of Scott's most important treasures, including what was probably the most significant one, the Thor's pony cap. Now, the cap and horns were um, uncovered when a moss on the farm of Thor's at Kelton in Kirkubrishire was drained sometime before 1820. Train passed it on to Scott in uh, 1829, and it remained a feature of Abbotsford throughout the 19th century. Indeed, in 1899, a replica of it was commissioned by the National Museum with permission of the then owner of Abbotsford, Mary Monica Maxwell Scott, for show in the new Queen Street premises. Somewhat ironically, I think, even given Scott's jealous guarding of his collections, Mary Monica's son, remember this name, Major General Sir Walter Maxwell Scott, because we'll come back to him a couple of times, sold the pony cap at auction in London in 1921. And it's a measure of how importantly the society and the museum viewed this treasure that they were prepared to bid up to £750 for it. Now, it doesn't sound like much nowadays, um, but it was a small fortune in uh, 1921. Luckily for the society and the museum's finances, uh, they actually secured it for £305. So we were managed to, to continue, but they were prepared to, to really make a go of this. Another train group that also ended up in the National Museum was the so-called Terloisk Mull Gold Hoard, although we now know that this actually came from the south of Ireland. The Major General sold this to the museum in uh, 1934. But very curiously, part of the deal with the museum was that the replica of the pony cap that we had should go back to Abbotsford. And it's still there to this day. The replica that is on show in Abbotsford was the museum's. I think clearly the earlier sale of the, the pony cap had been a bit of a, a problem with Abbotsford. But it didn't prevent the Major General continuing to sell rather a large number of items to the museum between 1921, when he inherited the estate, and his death in 1954. <clears throat> Perhaps more significantly, of course, for the estate itself, he continued to sell bits of land uh, that Scott had very dearly bought. So, a lot of the, the original estate of Abbotsford was sold off at this period. Um, I think it, at its maximum, it uh, encompassed something like 4,000 acres. And it's back down to about 100 acres now. So, let's have another look at the building itself, just in case you forgot what it looks like. Ian Gang described Abbotsford as one of the most famous houses in the world, the archetype of a literary shrine and the crucial house in the popularisation of the Scottish baronial revival. He goes on to marvel at the almost miraculous and complete survival of Scott's collections, which remain in more or less the positions that he planned for them, with a few changes. But I would also suggest that Scott saw this not just as a home, and not just as the physical expression of the place in the world that he'd carved out for himself as Wizard of the North, but as an indispensable tool for his labours. The books, documents, Objects and artefacts that he painstakingly assembled were a source of inspiration and information to fuel his imagination and uh, his, the information he needed to fuel his gargantuan literary output. Because remember, it's not just poems and novels, but histories, biographies, transcriptions of historical documents. He produced a huge amount. And Abbotsford, I think, was his research centre of excellence that allowed him to do this. And it's hard, really, to overestimate the importance of his library, this magnificent building here, um, well, this magnificent part of it, plus the study. The library, Scott's library, contains over 8,500 volumes. It's unique in Britain as the only writer's library to remain untouched in situ, virtually, as he arranged it. 
Yeah. And here we have a good example from an earlier watercolour. The books in his study were arranged in such a way that the ones that he used most were closest to him, just like we do today. And it's still the case. Um, it contains all sorts of unique gems, such as the incomparable collection of works on witchcraft and demonology, and the lesser known but almost more important collection of ephemeral sources, um, the, the broadsides, the chat books, the sort of ephemeral stuff that just disappears, that really were amazing sources for what might now be called Scottish folk life and ethnology. It's not well known, but it's an amazing collection. Likewise, I would say his collection of archaeological and historical artefacts are an immensely important source for both his serious study of Scottish antiquity and for his literary creations. He repurposed that old word uh, from military fortifications to describe them. They became his gabions. Sadly, he never completed the work that was intended to be a descriptive caption, a descriptive catalogue of all these uh, collections, the curiously named Reliquae Tropcosiensis, or the gabions of the late Jonathan Oldbuck, Esquire of Monk Barnes. Old Buck, of course, was the eponymous hero of the antiquary, and we'll come on to him a bit later. Uh, professors Alison Rumsden and David Hewitt have produced a wonderful edition of this work, posthumous edition, um, but it is a work of literature, and Scott was not a curator in the modern sense. Many of you will say, thank God, of course. <clears throat> um, and it's one of the great frustrations, I think, when dealing with this, that you look in vain for a comprehensive and detailed account of how, where, and why Scott acquired most of his collection. Um, so he wasn't a modern curator or archaeologist. Um, there was a, a frustrating lack of provenance for most of his collection. And it's very irksome to a modern researcher. So one has to thank both Trevor Cowie and Colin Wallace, who I think are both here tonight, for their amazing work that they did in the, the, the paper that they produced for the Antiquaries book on Abbotsford in 2003, edited by Ian Brown, who I think is also here. Um, the fact that they're painstaking research did allow them to put together the provenance of some of these objects is, is quite remarkable. So, after that plug, I think the book's sold out now, isn't it? Yes. We'll just have to reprint it. Let's come on to Scott's relationship with the, with the society. Um, and we can't get away from this. His relationship with the society was a little bit fractured, shall we say. Maybe lukewarm and sporadic might be a way of putting it. Um, and that's a bit odd, considering how closely aligned their core interests were. Scott was elected a fellow in 1796, and he did contribute a few communications and a very few donations to the society. The most famous one is this rather peculiar object. Do you all know what that is? The one on the right-hand side, not the left-hand side. <coughs> it's a calf's heart stuck full of pins. Um, used as a counter charm against witchcraft discovered in a house in Dalkeith. And again, most of us will say counter charms against witchcraft are still probably quite useful in Dalkeith. <laughs> but somewhat surprisingly, given Scott's own interest in, and fascination in the um, witchcraft and demonology, he presented this to the society in 1827, where it went to become the really laid the foundation for a very good collection of charms and amulets. The reason, or the reasons, for Scott's lack of engagement with the society are very complex and a bit hard to disentangle. Um, undoubtedly, basic rivalry over collecting, I think, played a, a part. The late Bronze Age hoard, uncovered on the draining of Duddingston Loch in 1778, was partially presented to the Society of Antiquaries in 1781, our very first donation. But other items from the original discovery found their way into Scott's collection. We didn't get the whole hoard. Some bits ended up with Scott, and some bits, I think, ended up with the king as well. But Scott guarded his bits very jealously, and he made no attempt, as far as I can find, to reunite them with the group that was held by the antiquaries. The Abbotsford elements did eventually come to the museum as one of the items sold by the Major General. Scott's role in the question of the Lewis chessmen is also quite interesting because he looked at these when they were in London uh, for consideration by the British Museum 
But there was no sense that he was trying to acquire them for the Society of Antiquities. If he was going to get them, he would have been for himself. But he didn't. And perhaps this lack of commitment should also be just put down to the fact this was during the time of his, of his last and fatal illness. But I think, undoubtedly, a major part of Scott's arm's length approach to the society has to be put down a little bit to the clash of personalities and his much reported dislike of the society's founder, David Stuart Erskine, the Earl of Buchan. Here we are. And of course, we remember Scott's famous comment on him, on the Earl's death in April 1829. And I quote, Lord Buchan is dead. A person whose immense vanity, bordering on insanity, obscured or rather eclipsed very considerable talents. His imagination was so fertile that he seemed really to believe the extraordinary fictions which he delighted in telling. Now, I still know quite a few historians and archaeologists who believe that as well. But we'll throw, an, uh, draw a veil over that. Um, his relationship with Buchan was probably not helped when a few years earlier, in um, 1819, when um, the Earl, on hearing that Scott was ill in his Edinburgh home in Castle Street, immediately called on him to reassure him that all would be well. He would personally take charge of Scott's funeral, having drawn up a complete plan, and the ceremony would be go fine, and he would have pronounced the eulogy over his grave. Despite his illness, Scott laughed till he cried when he heard this absurdity, because he had no intentions of dying. And again, I think there also seems to have been quite a good deal of personal rivalry over collections. And it should be remembered here that Buchan had started creating his own temple of the Caledonian fame at Dryborough, only six miles down the river from Abbotsford. But he'd started collecting this and started creating this long before Scott took possession of Abbotsford. It is perhaps, therefore, a wee bit ironic that both of these, not kindred spirits, uh, are buried within a stone's throw of one another in Driver Abbey. And here we have the famous water colour pen and ink of Scott's funeral. But a final cause, I think, of the distance between Scott and the antiquaries was possibly rank politics. Some recent work, or relatively recent work, has suggested that the society was in part founded as an attempt to strike a blow against Henry Dundas's despotism, which had, through the use of patronage, controlled virtually all of Edinburgh's academic institutions. So there we have the, the society on one side and Dundas and his cronies on the other side. Guess which side Scott was on. Scott was, of course, a fervent Tory and closely allied to the, the Dundas camp. But Scott was well aware of the society's collections. Um, and he wasn't above of making he wasn't above making use of them in his novels. So we'll go on to look at a couple of these. Um, Rob Roy is, is the best example, published in 1817, where it contains a notice of at least two items from the Society's Museum: the maiden or beheading machine. Now I always think it's fascinating. The museum acquired this in 1897, probably. Well, I'm assuming in response to the fact that its more famous cousin. The guillotine was still in perfect use and being used at great rate across the water in France. Um, and I suspect that this is exactly why the society acquired the maiden. Thought, guillotine, yes, we've got something like that, just to prove that we Scots did everything first and everything better. <clears throat> Scott, of course, writes it into Rob Roy, uh, where it's seen as a threat to encourage uh, an end to Highland feuding. Um, it will be time to share the maiden for shearing of craigs and thrapples. Excellent. Perhaps even more fascinating, of course, is this object. Um, the extraordinary and unique, as far as I know, sporn clasp or cantle of brass containing four miniature pistols concealed with inside it. This was given to the museum in um, 1783, again, one of the very earliest donations, by Francis McNabb of McNabb. <laughs> Scott knew it well and wove it into Rob's uh, dangerous persona. And here I quote, I advise no man to attempt to open this sporran unless he has my secret. And in, the, volume, in the, the novel, he goes on to give a detailed description of how to pull one thing and push the other and such like, and then it will open. Um, and he ends up with, this is the keeper of my privy purse. On well, having had a good look at it, I don't think even knowing the secret, it would be 
sensible to try and open it because I think the only person that would ever likely be damaged by this was the wearer. <laughs> but anyway, and I think it's somewhat bizarre as well that um, this, there's a tremendous um, incidence here of literary transference because the Museum of Sporn, which is on display next door, is now known to all and sundry as Rob Roy's Sporn. Despite the fact that Rob Roy, in this instance, was a fictitious character, uh, and had, the Sporn had nothing to do with, with, with Rob Roy himself, the real Rob Roy. Um, but it has now become Rob Roy's Sporn. And you have to tell everybody to come in and say, can I see Rob Roy's Sporn? So, yes, this one is, it's, it's not really his. It's just Scott creating this literary construct. Um, and finally, uh, looking at objects that Scott wrote into the novels, we come to this one, which I think is possibly one of the most fantastic of all. Mm. Um, this comes from The Antiquary, which was published a year earlier, in 1816. And he includes this in Jonathan Oldbuck's collections. And it's described as a collar engraved with the name of a fellow convicted of theft whose services had been adjudged to a neighbouring baron in lieu of the modern Scots punishment. Now, this is taken directly from this collar, which was given to the society in 1784 by William McKillop, having been found in the River Forth at Logie. And it relates to a documented criminal case in 1701, where one poor unfortunate Alexander Stewart in Perth was convicted of theft and instead of being executed, was given in perpetual servitude to Alexander Erskine of Alva. Uh, now, as, our, as Erskine uh, owned numerous and operated numerous coal mines in Alva and in the surrounding area, uh, and, of course, as colliers were in effect serfs at this time, it's been assumed that poor old Stuart, and of course we can't see his name, um, was actually sent to become a serf in the Alva mines. And it is salutary to remember, of course, that the time of the, even at the time of the gift, the collar itself dates to 1701. It was given to the museum in 1784. Serfdom among colliers and salt panners continued in Scotland until 1799. It's astonishing that in the midst of all of this uh, enlightenment, we still had serfdom. So we shouldn't craw too much about the enlightenment, perhaps. Now, let's continue. Scott took his study of Scottish antiquity seriously. Um, there's no doubt about that. But I think he was secure enough in his understanding of the subject to be able to poke gentle fun at it and those engaged in it. And here we come back to one Jonathan Oldbuck, Esquire of Monk Barnes, the antiquary. I think surely one of Scott's greatest and most amusing creations. Now he, Jonathan Oldbuck, I think is definitely uh, a mixture of Scott himself and numerous other noted antics of the day. And I rather like the term that they use, antics, A-N-T-I-K-S. I think some of us still refer to ourselves as that. Uh, the scene where Monk Barnes is regaling his somewhat overwhelmed young friend Lovell with a very, very detailed description of an earthwork feature on his estate known as the Came of Kinprunes, and Scott's uh, names are just wonderful. It's a classic of Scott's wit. Um, Monk Barnes describes it at length, as more, most archaeologists will, of course. <laughs> Uh, only some of you laughed at that. Didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> some of the back are very quiet. <laughs> yeah. um, anyways, uh, Monk Barnes describes it as undoubtedly the praetorium of Agricola's last camp before his army went on to battle the Caledonians at Mons Gaucius. Only, of course, to have his hobby horse completely overturned by the barefaced cheek of Edioffel Tree, the beggar, and well, the very, very wise old beggar of the story who says, Praetorium here, Praetorium there, a mind who will begin it. And Eddie goes on to explain that indeed the Praetorium was in fact built as a shelter for the masons building the dikes about 20 years ago. <laughs> now Scott, of course, borrowed this story directly from one attributed to Sir John Clark of Pennycook, another noted antic of the day. Now that's, it's good to, 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 to enjoy Scott's humour here, but of course, his fun undoubtedly flowed from a deep-seated knowledge and a commitment to Scottish history and antiquarianism, which was a la had a lasting impact on not just Scotland. No less a figure than Daniel Wilson, 
and this is me trying to get back into the good books of the archaeologist, um, no less a figure than Daniel Wilson in his seminal work, The Archaeology and Prehistoric Annals of Scotland, published just under 20 years after Scott's death, commented that the zeal for archaeological investigation, which has, been recent, which has recently manifested itself in nearly every country in Europe, has been traced, not without reason, to the impulse which proceeded from Abbotsford. It's clear that Scott knew of the latest thinking in prehistoric studies emanating from the Scandinavian scholars and indeed argued for the concept of the Bronze Age um, as early as 1814. And that's only a year after the first Danish reference to the Bronze Age. And I'm very gra grateful to our past treasurer, Brendan O'Connor, for this reference. So Scott knew about these things. He, he didn't just make fun of things. But to come back to his life, of course, he didn't long live to enjoy the creation of Abbotsford. Um, the clouds are gathering, just in case you don't know what clouds are. <laughs> the major international financial crash of 1826 effectively ruined him. He'd certainly been profligate in his spending in Abbotsford, both in the building and of the buying of land. Um, but I think it was really the convoluted financial arrangements with his publisher and printers, both constables and valentines, with each lending and borrowing from the other that brought the final disaster. Their effect, their, these arrangements were effectively based on credit secured on Scott's future output. In the good times, this was fine, but when the banks collapsed and credit was withheld, the whole edifice came crashing down. Does it sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> However, um, as we know, Scott did indeed eventually write himself, or rather really his family, he wrote his family out of debt, but at a huge personal cost. He died on the 21st of September 1832, when his sick bed, having been brought down from his upper floor bedroom to the dining room here, so that he could hear the sound of his tweed, which flows just along here. Mm. But luckily... Abbotsford remained in the family until 2004. Its family connection ended with the death of Dame Jean Maxwell Scott. Uh, her sister, um, Patricia Mac Mrs. Patricia Maxwell Scott, had predeceased her in um, 1998. And here I'd like to dispel one of the often quoted errors. The ladies, Patricia and Jean Maxwell Scott, were not the last descendants of Scott. There are lots of other descendants of Scott, uh, and there are still quite a few who are involved with Abbotsford, and particularly one, Lucy Maxwell Scott, is a very active member of our trust. The ladies were the last descendants of Scott to live at Abbotsford, uh, and they devoted their lives to keeping Abbotsford open as a vibrant visitor attraction. Um, and of course, we have to remember here, Abbotsford had been open as a visitor attraction from virtually a few months after Scott's death. There was a steady procession of members of the public who wanted to come and worship at this literary shrine. At its height, the ladies were welcoming some 80,000 visitors a year. But unfortunately, troubles like the American visitors dropping off after the 9-11 disaster dramatically reduced the number of visitors and, of course, led to a steady worsening financial position. On danger. On Dame Jean's death in 2004, the rest of the family weren't in a position to do anything about it. They couldn't take it on financially. And eventually, after a lot of doing and throwing, a trust was set up with the sole purpose of safeguarding the future of Abbotsford. Now, from the very beginning, and this is what I start with my plug about the trust and what we're doing now, uh, and it will end up with you all being asked to, to sign up to come along and see us, um, from the very beginning, the trust was absolutely determined that this should be a going concern, and they did not want to keep coming back to government for more money to keep it going. So um, they developed a very ambitious business plan, um, we're in the midst of discovering just how ambitious, um, and they set out to raise nearly £15 million, which included a £3 million endowment scheme, an endowment fund to act as a backstop. To date, the total cost of the restoration of the house, which is going on here, um, including the provision of the new visitor centre, which I'll tell you about in a minute, was is 11.68 million. And when I last checked, we already have, in cash or promises, 
4.85 million from the Heritage Lottery Fund, 2.45 million from the Scottish Government, 1.5 million from the Scottish Borders Council, we're very grateful to them, and over 2 million from other trusts, foundations and individuals. This is well over 11, we're nearly at 12 million pounds, but we are still working extremely hard to bridge that shortfall, particularly the endowment part of it all. So if anybody's feeling particularly flush just now, uh, I know of a man who will quite happily take your money from you. <clears throat> so what have we been spending the money on? Well, first of all, well, there are three main elements. And first of all, of course, is the restoration of the historic house that you see here. This is the most challenging, and I'll come on to that. Then we have the creation of a visitor reception building and a new car park, which is a, a, an absolute essential. And finally, the development of what's known as the Hope Scott Wing into some luxury rental accommodation to bring in much needed uh, revenue to keep the whole thing going. So we'll start off with the house. Um, this has been a, a real challenge and we've had, it, it, there is a, we're in the process of a very careful renovation of the house and restoration of the house. It's a uniquely important building and it's important to get this right. It's a huge challenge to integrate modern necessities like fire suppression and security systems without damaging the interior. Now, all this work has been undertaken based on the best advice from Historic Scotland and supervised by the architects LDN. And, and curiously enough, done to a wonderful standard by local builders, MNG Ballantines of Kelso. Um, now, Ballantines have clearly moved from publishing into building. <clears throat> and it's making them more money, I think. Um, but we've not attempted to return it to exactly how it was in Scott's day. This was just going to be impractical. And also, it would have lost part of its history as a visitor attraction. Um, and as I said, it was open throughout the year. It was open throughout this time as a visitor attraction, but it wasn't open throughout the year. It was also a family house. Family used it all in the winter months when the visitors went away. And this has led to some amazing discoveries. Because when the visitors went away, the, the, the family moved back in. But when the visitors came, they were very canny and they rolled up the carpets. They took up the carpets so the hoi polloi wouldn't damage the wonderful carpets. And we have discovered them again, rolled up in the basement for decades, unknown. This is the original carpet being unrolled here from the library. And even more importantly, the study carpet. This is the second study. This is the original carpet that goes in here. This is the same part of the building. So that's a, an amazing find. We're not putting them back down again because they would just disintegrate. But we have, they are being preserved and interpreted. Another thing we discovered, or rather the builders discovered in considerable consternation, the original well from the cottage. Um, note here the wonderful lead pipe that fed the, uh, the water system. Um, might suggest something about the, the mental health of some of the folk later on. But <clears throat> anyway, and what else did we discover? Yes, the almost complete absence of foundations under part of the, uh, the Hope Scott Wing, uh, which is a considerable consternation. Must have been Hoyt builders on this bit, I think. <laughs> but we're very careful in refreshing much of the original decoration. But we've decided, for example, not to undo the modernization of the library. This was attributed again to the Major General turning into something of a bête noire, I'm afraid. Um, well, actually, it wasn't to the Major General. It was to his second wife, Marie, an American, who lightened Scott's gloomy room by painting the ceiling white. The original was painted to look like oak beams with um, um, clouds above it. And she lime-washed the wood and some of the furniture. So we decided not to undo that have decided rather to interpret it and explain it as part of the history of the house. Because remember when she did this, to give her some credit I suppose, um, this, the, the, the dining room was not part of the public tour, this was part of the private rooms. We're also going to be very careful about how we interpret uh, the, the building. Um, we'll be introducing far more interpretation, but we'll be doing it with a light, very light touch. There will be no blizzard of labels and um, 
panels and such like. We've tried to do most of it by means of an audio tour and some very discreetly positioned uh, panels, and also, of course, by well-briefed um, room stewards. Uh, this is incredibly important. We don't want to lose the atmosphere of the building. Now, we're well on the way to the last um, part of the, the, this project. We'll be reinstalling um, everything. But behind it, I just want to make a couple of points. The people that were involved, the team that were involved, are professional conservator, con um, curator, and um, learning and engagement officer, have done a fantastic job, aided by a fantastic array of volunteers. Decanting Abbotsford was not for the faint-hearted. There were thousands of items to be carefully located and decanted so that the work could take place. And of course, one of the things we did here was take the opportunity to actually inventory the place for the first time, <coughs> complete inventory of Abbotsford for the very first time. And it's all about to go back in uh, as it will open, the house will reopen in summer of this year. But of course, the building... The, the, the historic house is not the only part of the project, and of course there's been lots of other things going on. And the most obvious example of this, and probably the most obvious part of the whole project, is this. This is the visitor reception building. Mm. Um, this opened late last year, opened in, in August last year. Um, it was again it was another challenge to provide 21st century visitor uh, facilities without detracting from the house and its environment. And just to show that for once, this is the design by the architect, we did actually get what the architects said they were going to give us, not something that always happened. And I think they've been very successful in blending it into the landscape. Once the grass has grown here and once some of the planting has grown here, this building blends beautifully with the landscape. And this is the view of Abbotsford from the building. The building is set slightly back from the, the house. <clears throat> and the whole point of the building was to provide these facilities away from the house. We provided, obviously, a cafe, or, or actually a very smart restaurant, uh, called after our old friend Edie. This is Ochel Trees, uh, and it's now become a firm favourite amongst many borderers. Uh, it's doing very good business, I have to say, because the food is excellent. Uh, we had to produce the, uh, provide a, a wonderful facility like this. Part of the, the entire raison d'etre behind this was to provide the visitor centre as a free um, opportunity. You don't have to pay to get into the visitor centre um, where the exhibition is, and I'll say a little bit more about the exhibition. This is very important because we're absolutely determined to make sure this is a, a place that local people will come back to again and again. It's not meant just for, for foreign visitors. And they seem to be coming in droves. Remember, the house isn't open, but the visitor centre is open, and people are coming in droves, particularly to the exhibition. And this is, the again, to show that the design actually was delivered. The exhibition is very much about setting Scott and Abbotsford into a wider context. So it explains a great deal about Scott's life, it explains about the building of Abbotsford, and it also it gives, a, a, I think, a fantastic insight into Scott and his worldwide context. Here's some other examples. Mm. Very fine. And again, just to show, we did get what, um, what the, the architects promised us. The view from these windows, of course, go out, looks out to Abbotsford itself, out to the, the house itself. And there is a wonderful little model here that you can look at and understand how it was built and then see the building here. The reason it's missing there is because the model builders didn't deliver it on time. But we'll not get into that because that's a, that's a shame. Um, the exhibition has been very successful, I'm pleased to, uh, to say, with particularly with local schools. We've had secondary schools and primary schools visiting in their droves, and we're delighted with, about this. Um, it's, a, it's a testimony to the, to the team uh, of Dr. Sandra McNeil, who's our Lending Engagement Officer, Matthew Withy, who's the curator, and Joanna Cook, that you see here, our cons uh, Conservation Officer. They've done a fantastic job, and it is beginning to work. So, just about to wrap up, <clears throat> and if, I'm, if I spin it out a bit, I'll get to seven o'clock, and that'll mean there's no questions, but no. <laughs> the final part of the jigsaw is the restoration of the Hope Scott Wing. This is the, the Hope Scott Wing here. The Scott bit of it 
Walter's bit is here, this is the Hope Scott Wing. Um, in 1847, Abbotsford was inherited by Charlotte, Scott's granddaughter. She married James Hope and they took the name Hope Scott. Close friends of Cardinal Henry Newman, the family converted to Roman Catholicism and built the chapel here on the side of the new uh, house. Um, I said that the building, that the original building, was constantly open to the public, but the Hope Scots wanted to continue this, but they also wanted to have a building that they could use that wasn't constantly being invaded by the public. So they built this entirely new wing on one, one end. And it's to the Hope Scots that we have to thank for the current arrangements of, of getting round the building, oh, well, the arrangements that were in place up until last year when we closed. They built uh, a new, an entrance to the building, a public entrance to the building in the basement, and a sort of covered walk. Those of you who have been to Abbotsford will know there's a kind of covered walkway down the side of the, the, the garden that takes you into the basement. This was basically so that the hoi polloi visitors weren't viewed by the, the, the family who were living here. So but we're doing away with that little bit of it. Uh, you'll be able to enter in a much uh, more uh, amenable way now. But anyway, um, this, uh, the Hope Scott Wing, was built in, in the, 19, uh, sorry, the 1850s. And um, we've decided to actually renovate the Hope Scott Wing and rent it out as five-star luxury self-catering accommodation. There are seven bedroom suites that combine modern facilities with carefully preserved charm of the original building. <laughs> Sounds like a travel brochure, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, it's worthwhile looking at, if only for the incorporation of the Thunderbox Lou that we still have there, which is, is rather wonderful. This is perhaps the most, con well, it's one of the more controversial parts of the project, um, because we are renting it out, we will be renting it out. But the Trust deemed it essential to bring in substantial income from the various enterprises, the, um, the restaurant, the renting out of the accommodation, and the retail facility that is up in the, the visitor centre. We are absolutely determined to make this uh, a going concern that does not have to come back cap in hand again and again to try and raise public money. This has to try and operate on its, off its own bat. Um, we are absolutely convinced that we have, we're doing the right thing. Uh, I hope you agree with us. Um, Abbotsford has had a worldwide influence. It's essential that we preserve this jewel, the jewel in the crown, and hopefully it will continue to have a worldwide influence when it opens again in the summer. Just in case you don't remember, this is what summer looks like. I hope that we'll be able to welcome you all uh, to Abbotsford in the summer when it opens. Thank you very much. Thank you.